The stage is yours, Dr. Jim Cummins. Most welcome. Uh, thank you, Maria. Let me just uh, share my screen and um, uh, get into the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm a little bit intimidated by the array of talent uh, that uh, Maria described uh, that uh, resides in the Benogi team. Um, it's uh, certainly impressive, and it's a uh, it's a uh, wonderful from my point of view to be uh, associated with Benogi and, and what it's trying to, to do. Um, let me uh, just talk a little bit about the title uh, that I've got for my uh, presentation. Curriculum for Multilingual Learners. To what extent can emerging digital technologies accelerate students' academic progress? And the, the context for much of the work that I've done uh, and um, and also the, the context in which Benogi is being implemented in, in many uh, countries, including Canada, is the uh, large uh, increase in students uh, in our schools who are learning the school language as an additional language. And uh, one of the concerns of, of many uh, agencies, uh, uh, many systems of, uh, of government, uh, and many educators is that uh, students who are uh, coming as immigrants to the host country, um, not knowing the language uh, of schooling, uh, will uh, very often take several years to, ca to learn that language. And by the time they've learned the language, they've lost out on the content that uh, has been taught in that language. And so uh, this is one of the areas that I've done some research in. And uh, when I first heard about Benogi, uh, I was very excited because there were numerous ways in which what Benogi was trying to do, the solution that uh, Benogi was trying to be, connected up with research that I had done and, and concerns of educators in Canada, in the United States, in Sweden, and in many countries around the world. So what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of background about those issues and also share with you some of the experiences in the Canadian context relating to how Benogi has been used. So um, first of all, let me give you a little bit more um, information about my background. You see two maps on the screen uh, right now. Um, one of them uh, is the map of Ireland where I grew up. Uh, I was born in Dublin. I uh, went to university uh, in Dublin and I went to Canada in the early 70s to do uh, uh, doctoral work. I spent five frozen years of my life in Edmonton, in the western part of Canada, in, in the province of Alberta. I experienced minus 40 degrees for the first and hopefully the last time uh, out there. And uh, then I went back to Ireland for two years and um, uh, did uh, educational research uh, in, a, in a center in Dublin, then went back to Canada. So I have one foot on either side of the Atlantic and uh, in terms of the professional and, and research work uh, that I've done. And the issues that I've uh, been concerned with uh, in my own research involve technology and education, um, language teaching issues, uh, issues related to bilingual education where two languages are used as mediums of instruction, and then specifically the education of immigrant background students or students that increasingly are being labeled as multilingual learners. Um, and when we look at, at uh, those issues, um, uh, they form the the basis of what I want to try and uh, communicate in this uh, in this presentation. So I've divided it up into four uh, sections, um, and uh, one of these um, uh, uh, first section is the the current status of technology and education. Just to get a, a reality check in terms of uh, the way technology has been used in education, the uh, advantages, possible disadvantages of it. it it's certainly not the, um, uh, the solution that everybody thinks it might be or many policymakers have thought it might be. Um, and one of the reasons for that I'm gonna suggest is that we've forgotten to integrate the technology with specific um, issues that it can address and specific forms of pedagogy that uh, it lends itself to. Uh, then I'll move on to just very briefly look at some current trends in second language teaching and the fact that there's a lot of research uh, currently that when we want to develop um, students' um, knowledge of the language and academic knowledge of the language, 
uh, bilingual approaches that integrate the teaching of academic content and language generally generally work better than teaching the second language or the L2 just as an isolated subject within the curriculum. Then I'll look at, at what we know about teaching immigrant background learners and the fact that when we look at the trajectories of catching up academically, um, uh, the research suggests that at least five years is typically required on average uh, for students to catch up academically. And so a question that comes up and that I'll try and address in the in the session is, can new technologies accelerate this process? And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about Benogi's potential to promote transfer across languages or productive contact across languages, and also accelerate academic catch up among immigrant multilingual learners. And I'll share some of the experiences of uh, teachers in Canadian schools. <clears throat> so first of all, let's take a look at excuse me, historically and currently at the role of technology. And over the past 50 years, there have been multiple new technologies, for example, television, uh, that have been introduced into education. And generally speaking, uh, these technologies have promised a lot, but in fact have delivered very little with respect to improved learning and also reducing inequities in education. If we think about the impact of television, uh, when television was first introduced into education, there was great um, hopes that uh, we could put the curriculum into a televised um, uh, uh, platform and then just transmit the information that we want to, tra to transmit to students in that way. Obviously, that hasn't happened. And there's a, a book that was written by an American researcher called Larry Cuban uh, that came out in uh, 2001. It's more than 20 years ago. And he was talking about the um, impact of, of technology and education. And there's a quote here that I think is sobering uh, when we look at our current realities. He says the billions of dollars um, that have been spent on wiring, hardware, and software have established the material conditions for frequent and imaginative uses of, <clears throat> uses of technology to occur. Pardon, was there a problem? Okay. No, no problem. Keep on. Okay, sorry. Um, and many students and teachers have acquired skills and have engaged in serious uses of the, the serious use of these technology. Nonetheless, overall, the quantities of money and time have yet to yield even modest returns or to approach what has been promised in academic achievement, creative integration of technologies, and transformations in teaching and learning. And when we look at the debates about technology use over the last 20 or 30 years, critics have highlighted the, the fact that a lot of scarce resources have been diverted into technology from other areas of the curriculum. And they pointed to the failure of virtually every technological innovation introduced to schools during the past century to improve learning in any significant way. Um, if we look at some of the current uh, realities, and we can take a look at the Swedish situation. Where just a few weeks ago, there was a uh, an article in the British newspaper, The Guardian, uh, that was entitled Switching Off, Sweden Says Back to Basic Schooling Works on Paper. Um, and it uh, quoted the schools minister, Lotta uh, Edholm, uh, her skepticism in relation to just handing out uh, tablets to uh, to students and expecting magic to happen. Um, and so she's been one of the biggest critics of the all out embrace of technology. So that debate is continuing <laughs> yeah, in our schools uh, as we um, uh, 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 as we as we're talking. It's uh, and this is a, an international debate. To what extent can technology improve education? And the the jury is still out on that issue. <clears throat> Um, so if we look at um, uh, some recent trends in second language teaching, um, there was a, an assumption over many, many years that when we teach in uh, second languages, we should stay within the second language and try to keep students' home languages away from any kind of corrupting influence on, on students' um, uh, learning of the second language. <clears throat> And that has changed over the last 15 years. There's been much more focus on the fact that the two languages can help each other, that when we bring them into productive contact, there can be benefits 
not only for learning the second language, <clears throat> but also uh, for uh, students' knowledge of the first language. There's a growing emphasis on the notion of translanguaging, which some of you may be aware of. Uh, and this involves often teaching for cross-linguistic transfer, promoting language awareness, <clears throat> excuse me a sec, and enabling students to carry out creative and intellectually challenging projects with the second language. There's also been a, a growth in the number of bilingual programs and second language immersion programs that have been implemented. And what the, for example, in, in the Canadian context, there's a large network of what are called French immersion programs where students from English home backgrounds or sometimes other home backgrounds are taught initially through the medium of French. Uh, and these have been evaluated very widely. And what has been found is that students develop reasonably fluent oral and literate second language skills at no cost to their literacy skills in the first language. Uh, it doesn't, th these are not magical routes to second language um, uh, proficiency because there's still issues in terms of students' knowledge of grammar and or in both oral and written use. <clears throat> and then in many European countries, we have what are called content and language integrated learning or CLIL programs. And this is a less intensive form of bilingual education in which one or two subjects are taught through the second language, usually starting either in the upper primary grades or lower secondary school grades. And again, these have generally been found to be quite successful and more successful in teaching the language just as a subject. So what we see here is both a, a trend to bring students' languages into productive contact and also looking at how content <clears throat> across the school curriculum uh, can be uh, integrated with learning of the second language. And again, th both of those trends are evident in uh, Benogi also. So if we look at, at what the research is saying about some of these issues, um, what we see is uh, the fact that the two languages are not necessarily separate in the learning process. And many years ago, but more than 40 years ago, I tried to formulate a visual metaphor to represent that. And this double iceberg or dual iceberg <clears throat> representation of bilingual proficiency is uh, what you see in the screen. And I've called this a common underlying proficiency. And this, is, this forms the empirical basis for teaching for cross-linguistic transfer. And what this is basically saying is that even though we can distinguish languages, Swedish is not the same language as English, Chinese is different from both of them. At a surface level, um, languages can be clearly distinguished. But at a deeper level, at a deeper cognitive level, there's a lot of overlap or interdependence across languages. And so this common underlying proficiency represents a fusion of cognitive, academic, and linguistic knowledge. For example, if you think of a, a concept like democracy, um, obviously something that's in the news a lot these days, uh, this is a, a concept, it's a cognitive uh, uh, concept. It's also part of the school curriculum. It's an academic concept. And obviously it's, a, it's linguistic, it's a, it's a word. If we want to go into detail about its linguistic origins, we can go back to the Greek uh, and uh, the two words, or the two uh, parts of the word, uh, demos and uh, krasi, um, refer to the people and power, power to the people. And so that's what we're talking about in terms of what transfers across languages. Um, there's another um, metaphor that I think also <clears throat> illustrates very well the, um, the nature of the neurological connections across languages. And this comes from a New Zealand researcher, Sophie Tawea Tamati, uh, who pointed to the Kaikatea tree, which is a tree that's unique to New Zealand. And it grows in waterlogged, swampy soil. And so the roots don't go down very deep because of the nature of the soil, but they gain their strength because they the roots intertwine with each other across multiple trees. And Sophie talks about bilingual and multilingual reality as being very much um, similar to this, where even though we can distinguish individual trees above the surface, at a deeper level, there's a lot of dynamic interactions across languages. 
So um, if we move on to the next uh, section, in the case of newcomer multilingual students, what are the major challenges uh, for students and, and teachers and how might emerging technologies respond to these challenges? Um, so while students are learning the school language, if a student comes in not knowing any Swedish in at age 10, 11, 12, uh, how do we enable them to keep on learning academic content at the same time as they're learning the school language? Um, and so how can teachers support newcomer students in transferring concepts and knowledge they've acquired in their home language to the school language? And as I said before, the term translanguaging has been used in recent years to highlight the dynamic connections across languages and the importance of, of enabling multilingual students to make use of their entire linguistic, conceptual, experiential, and intellectual repertoire to support their learning. <clears throat> And as I'll, I'll try and point out, I think Binogi can address most of these issues uh, very powerfully. <clears throat> so if we look at, at the research in terms of newcomer students' academic catch-up trajectories, what you see in, in the graph in the diagram is a, a reanalysis of data from the Toronto Board of Education that I was able to do more than 40 years ago. Um, where the This is a, a picture vocabulary test. Um, Length of residence, LOR stands for, is the length that students have been in the Canadian context. These are immigrant background students who are learning English as an additional language. And then down at the, in the horizontal, horizontal axis, uh, we're talking about age and arrival. <clears throat> and you can see there that students have been in Canada for one year are still about one and a half standard deviations or maybe 22, 23 standard score points below the mean in terms of their knowledge of English vocabulary. After three years, they come up to about uh, one standard deviation below 15 standard score points. But it's between five and seven years before they're getting close to, to, uh, to grade norms. And when these findings came out initially, a lot of teachers were surprised because they had considered students to have learned English much faster than that. And students had learned, um, uh, or uh, students had learned certain aspects of English. They had learned conversational knowledge of English. They could communicate um, relatively fluently in the language after maybe one or two years, particularly if they'd arrived at a younger age. But in terms of catching up academically, we're looking at a much longer uh, trajectory. And part of this is due to the complexity of academic language. We find academic language in two places. We find it in classrooms and we find it in printed text and textbooks and, and other forms of text. But also, the trajectory is relatively long because newcomer students are catching up to a moving target. Native speakers are not standing still, waiting for second language learners to catch up. Every year, they're expanding their mother tongue vocabulary, they're expanding their reading skills, they're expanding their writing skills. So newcomer students, in a way, have to run faster in order to bridge that gap. And so an issue comes up, how can we uh, accelerate that process or can we accelerate that process? And this is where Binogi comes in, um, because unlike a lot of um, uh, magical thinking surrounding technology where we just give tablets to students and expect magic to happen, Binogi responds directly to the challenges that newcomer students have. And it also responds directly to current trends in teaching additional languages. And uh, so for example, uh, if we're talking about CLIL programs that try to bring content together with um, uh, teaching languages, whereas frequently the language that's used to uh, in a CLIL program is geography or uh, a subject like that. This is bringing the target language together with what students already know in their first language and it's bringing content and language together. <clears throat> so um, just to, for those of you who may not be fully familiar with Binogi, Curriculum content is presented through three to five minute animated modules that are narrated both orally and in written form. And, and Binogi is available in multiple languages. Uh, students or teachers can choose the language in which they want to listen to the content. And they can also choose the language of the written subtitles. So for example, an Arabic speaking, Arabic speaking students could access a math mathematics lesson on the common denominator and fractions by listening to the lesson initially in Arabic with written support from Arabic subtitles. 
And then as their proficiency in the school language increases, they could access this content in the school language or listen to the content in the school language while continuing to use the Arabic subtitles as a support for comprehension. And what we see, I think, both in the Swedish context as well as the Canadian context is that initially, for obvious reasons, students will rely on their first language, but very quickly begin to go between the two languages in terms of looking at how the content in Arabic that they can understand connects up with the content in, in English. <clears throat> so this is um, just a, uh, an example of um, uh, what, uh, what, what Binogi looks like. Uh, you can see the, the languages that are available. These are in the Canadian context. Um, and you can see then in, in addition to, um, uh, if you like European languages like German, Spanish, English, French, et cetera, and Swedish, there are a large number or significant number of languages uh, that are the languages of immigrant communities in both Canadian and, and other contexts. So it's, it provides a, a wide range of access for students in their first language. <laughs> Um, we see here just what Binogi looks like in terms of the uh, the videos. Um, and when we look at some of the results of the initial pilot project that Emmanuel Pichon and uh, I and, uh, and uh, uh, Jakob uh, Borsman did uh, back in 2019, um, we saw students becoming very engaged with, um, with Binogi. Um, there's a quote here. Uh, where that highlights how students became uh, more invested in mathematics than they were before. Uh, one student said, before my math was really bad, but now when I tried Benogi, my math is very good, and now I know lots of things. From And from the students' narratives, it was clear that most of them felt empowered by the possibilities to adapt the lesson according to their own needs in terms of language, audio, and subtitle use. They could uh, control the speed of video, use first or second language quizzes, et cetera. So it gives the students a lot of um, individualization where they can adapt the content that they're getting access to, uh, to what they need. Um, here's just one uh, reaction to uh, Benogi, um, which you can read. Uh, what I like about Benogi is that they have characters, so it won't be boring. Um, I like how Benogi has varieties of different languages, so many people can learn math with whatever language they're comfortable with. So we've, we had a lot of, of uh, feedback from the students about uh, along these lines. <clears throat> and then um, Benogi in, in the Canadian context has been implemented uh, in, uh, in a couple of, of school boards. Uh, and one here is the Waterloo um, Catholic District School Board. Waterloo is a city about 100 kilometers west of Toronto. And I'll show you some of the um, uh, reactions of teachers to, uh, to Benogi and how they've used it. Um, you can look at the, the, um, the full video or full webinar there uh, when you get access to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. Um, so some of the uh, terms that teachers use in the videos might be worth explaining a little bit, co-teaching means when the English as a second language teacher and the content teacher collaborate together in the same class. Step, uh, step is sounds from steps to English proficiency. And this is an observational assessment system used in Ontario schools to monitor students' progress. ML and ELL stand for multilingual learners and English language learner, respectively. Uh, so Daniel, I'll, I'll hand over to you at this point. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Carrie and Barb and Brianna. And Patrick. We... We're going back and see it again. So as I uh, mentioned before, at the, the school that I'm at, we have these uh, ELL adapted level courses. So we have different teachers uh, teaching a subject such as, like I mentioned, science before there's math. 
Um, but there's also like geography, history, civics, careers, all these uh, high school level courses. So I went and I talked to a bunch of them and uh, we like to bounce ideas off each other and stuff like that. But uh, the thing that I noticed was a lot of the time we talk about uh, the use of translators um, for a lot of these students. And I think it's important to note that when a student is learning in the language, in their L1 language or their first language, um, they're a lot more comfortable and it allows them to feel more uh, like they have a sense of belonging in the classroom. And with that comfort, they get a lot more confident in uh, their ability to let you know what they have learned. Um, and with this, like uh, teaching them in, in English is one thing, um, but allowing them to have the, these different sources where they can learn things in their own language, like using translators or even uh, things like uh, a binogi, which is, you know, based off science and math, um, is, is definitely very beneficial for them and uh, for them in their learning. And when I talked to other teachers, they said uh, there was examples passed around, like the one student um, was given a test uh, in chemistry and they didn't do very well, but in class they were very vocal and, and they seemed to understand what they were doing, but it seemed on the test they just got confused with the English that was on there. So uh, the next test they were given, they were able to use the uh, translator so that they were able to read the test in their own language. And then they were able to do, they did, their grade went up a lot. So they ended up doing a lot better because now they understood what was being asked of them. And I think that's uh, the difference. So. Uh, we have to remember that in these courses, they're not being graded on their ability to speak English, they're rather being graded on their ability to learn the curriculum. So in these subject adapted courses, it's really important to remember that. So when we think about um, home and school partnership, um, Benogi offers something that's really unique um, because oftentimes our multilingual learner parent community um, really wants to be very involved and engaged with their child's learning. Um, and this allows them to do that. Students can go home and share um, the learning that's been happening in their class with their families um, and parents and kids can watch content videos together in their home language and complete quizzes. Uh, together and uh, try their best to uh, learn a, a science task or, or, or a skill um, or content area uh, together at home. So they are able to learn not just with their teachers, um, but maybe with uh, another guardian or parent that does speak uh, the same first language and home language as them as well. Uh, it really helps to affirm a student's background, um, knowledge and experience. So it invites a family's experience into the learning and, and acknowledges again that ac academic learning is not exclusive to English, um, just like Brianna pointed out and, and my other colleagues. So uh, it was really neat a, a few um, months ago. So prior to Christmas break um, in um, the co-teaching class that I'm a part of, it's a grade seven, eight class. Uh, we um, had the opportunity obviously of, of trying some Benogi tasks um, and assignments uh, and kids completed a few quizzes um, in class and we simply told the kids to go home, bring their Chromebooks, put it on the kitchen table um, and just play some lessons together, let their parents and, and family members listen and, and slowly we found out that by doing that and, and parents hearing academic language in their first language really uh, became the central pub uh, or sorry hub um, around that Chromebook. So there were a lot of kids um, also like maybe their age or a little bit younger or older that were taking part in some of the lessons as well and being part of that conversation. Um, one uh, specific girl really stood out to um, my co-teacher and I because uh, the next day after we had first launched the lessons and told the kids to, to go home and share, um, this, the students really quiet, really reserved uh, student. Um, she was, we, we met the kids as we always do outside in their line before coming in uh, the doors. And as soon as she saw us come out, she got out of her line and came and addressed me and said, Ms. Mendez, uh, I went home and I showed them, I showed them Benogi. And my dad said, uh, it, it, it's amazing, it's fantastic. 
uh, and you could see just the joy in her face from being able to share. It was it really kind of uncharacteristic of her to, to, to share something like that with us up until that point. Um, so you could really see that there was some really true love and engagement that came with uh, the conversations that were happening at home. This girl specifically, she is a higher step student, so she's not often needing to leverage her first language um, anymore in classroom. Um, but her parents, her parents do. Her parents do require uh, to hear the first language for them to be a part of the conversation um, and academic learning. So the child was just so happy to have shared that uh, with her parents and that her parents felt that she was doing something good and that you know, school environment was a happy and, and fun place for her to be. And so that really validated her feelings. And for us, I think it, it filled uh, my co-teacher and I up just as much as it did her that day. Um, and in many other cases, in, in conversation with other students, we've had, um, I had one Spanish speaking student who, who shared that her mother is learning a language, some adult language learning courses to learn English and some other courses as well. And she, um, she's been using Benogi as a tool as well to learn so that they're actually doing it at home together. So, um, which is a very neat experience. So I think it really does, Benogi really offers a really unique and maybe innovative way for the very first time where we're seeing a lot more uh, home and school partnerships happening. Put on your mic, Jim. Okay. Um, so I think you see some of the unique aspects uh, of Benogi in those um, uh, teachers' uh, uh, comments on, on it. First of all, um, stu when students can show their knowledge <clears throat> in their first language, uh, they can show more than they can typically show in the second language during that five plus year trajectory when they're catching up. Um, and we also see from what Jennifer Mendez was saying in the, the last comment by the teacher uh, about the potential for Benogi to engage the family, to uh, be a catalyst for conversations in the home about what students are learning. So rather than the typical situation where many immigrant background parents are uh, essentially excluded from any real involvement uh, with the school because they don't speak the language and they can't understand what's going on, here you have Benogi acting as a catalyst for these really productive uh, conversations uh, that involve the entire family. And so students um, are enabled to connect their first language knowledge to content and language in the school curriculum. Um, there also, uh, uh, we, we see from the research that we've done that there's uh, the potential for far greater engagement by students in learning. And there's also a shift in student identity and their self-image from feeling incompetent when they come and they don't understand the language, they don't feel very intelligent because they're, they know they're not doing well in class, even when we try to provide support for them in the learning, but we see Benogi has potential to move students' self-image from feeling incompetent to feeling competent and from frustrated learner to confident learner. The home language quizzes provide a more accurate assessment of content learning than assessment only in the school languages. And again, as Jennifer was uh, highlighting there, there are many possibilities for promoting home school partnerships and increased learning in the home. So I think Benogi has a lot of potential uh, that um, uh, still needs to be uh, exploited, still needs to be uncovered. And we're just, I think, beginning to scratch the surface of uh, how this tool can really transform education. So I'll stop there and look forward to uh, trying to answer some of the questions that you've got. Thank you, Jim, for sharing your solid experience and knowledge. I'm so inspired. <laughs> I can't see that anyone else had written anything yet. So I go ahead 
And uh, I stand here and think of many of our Swedish students uh, who start learning English at an early age. Swedish is a small language, of course, uh, worldwide. Can your conclusions about parallel language and knowledge acquisition benefit Swedish students learning of the third language, German, French, or Spanish, which is added at the age of 12? if we teach the new language at the same time as we teach subject knowledge in mathematics, biology, chemistry, for example. I get so uh, curious <laughs> about the uh, neurological connections, you say. Can you explain a little bit more? How um, sure. It, we're, we're talking about neurological connections. We're talking about uh, linguistic connections. If you take Swedish and, um, and English, for example, uh, there are very, very clear uh, rationales for bringing the two languages together because there's so many cognate relationships between the languages. And this, uh, when we understand the nature of English and the fact that English is a hybrid language, uh, then some of this becomes clear because the, um, uh, the uh, uh, language that we use in typical everyday uh, contexts in English, the everyday uh, high frequency words that we use, uh, come from uh, the uh, invasion by of what's now England by the Angles and Saxons, tribes from Northern Europe. Um, and after the Roman Empire began to disintegrate, they, br they brought their languages uh, to, um, uh, to what's now England. And uh, that was the language of the ordinary people. There wasn't a lot of education going on. Uh, and then in 1066, William the Conqueror invaded from Northern France. And he and the Normans uh, brought their language, which was a variety of old French, heavily influenced by Latin and to some extent Greek. And so English um, is a hybrid language where over the next several centuries, um, the, the two languages, the Anglo-Saxon language that the uh, Angles and Saxons brought integrated with the um, uh, Latin-based language that the Normans brought. And the Latin-based language was language of the ruling class. It was language of high status uh, functions. Obviously, the church was already using Latin, but the, uh, the le legal courts or legal system, the education system, all used Latin uh, for many, many years. And so when we look at English right now, those divisions are still there. And so if we're looking at, say, Swedish students learning English, there's going to be a lot of uh, 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 relationships, uh, words with the same roots in terms of the everyday language, the high frequency words in English. Many of them have very clear cognate relationships with Swedish, with Norwegian, with German, with Dutch, et cetera, uh, the languages of Northern Europe. But the language of academic uh, work uh, comes predominantly from Latin and Greek. And again, that will have influenced uh, Swedish also. So bringing the two languages together and kind of stimulating those neurological pathways to make those connections, uh, I think is very, very powerful. One, one of the issues uh, I think with uh, English too is English as we know has become basically the uh, lingua franca, particularly among younger people. There's a lot of media in English. There's a lot of youth culture in English. So arguably, English is an easier language for students to learn um, than, say, a language that is, is less commonly used internationally, like, for example, Swedish. And so that, that may mean that students learning English in an English-speaking country make faster progress in, in terms of conversational aspects of the language or everyday aspects than they might in, um, in say, stu students learning Swedish as the as the uh, uh, everyday language. So uh, there's lots of, of potential for using a tool like Binogi in teaching additional languages, in addition to its obvious potential for, uh, for use with newcomer students. Uh, I see here uh, another question, Maria. Is, uh, is that also the case when it comes to languages, totally different origins as Finnish and Swedish? If... When we look at the transfer across languages, there's clearly the linguistic transfer that'll come when languages have common roots. Um, but there's also conceptual transfer. The, for example, if we have a, a student 
uh, from, say, an Arabic-speaking background who comes into to Finland uh, as, a, as an immigrant student. And uh, let's suppose this student is 12 years old. She's been to school. She's learned science. She knows the concept of photosynthesis. She doesn't have to learn that concept all over again. Uh, in to understand it in Finnish. She obviously needs to understand how to talk about it in Finnish and Finnish vocabulary that's used to talk about that, but the concept is already there. So when we look at the transfer process and the languages coming together, it's not just languages that are similar linguistically, it's also the concepts that, that students have. Another example is if a student um, knows um, how to tell time uh, in, uh, in their home language, they don't have to relearn that all over again. They don't have to learn that there's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, et cetera. They have that knowledge. So it's a case of uh, bringing that concept, those concepts together with the new language. So interesting. I can see Fralot Stenlund is also say interesting. Thank you, Jim Cummings. This is why we need Binogi and content for the younger children as well. Please develop this. It is very much needed. <laughs> That's nice to hear. It was not a question. <laughs> <laughs> read it. Uh, do we have any more questions? Can't see any yet. Is there anything you want to add for us? Uh, listeners in Sweden and Finland, what we should think about or what we... And just to, uh, looking at the experience in Canada, where initially um, there was enthusiasm from some teachers, but other teachers were stressed. Obviously, COVID was, was happening at this time, so there was a lot of additional stress. And so... Um, uh, if it's only one or two teachers in a school that are using it, then it's going to be less powerful than if the entire school is going to uh, buy into it and see it as a tool that, that that is not just something that the English as a second language teacher uses, but it's something that can be used for teaching science, for teaching mathematics, et cetera. And so it, when, when the, the entire school uh, becomes familiar with the Nogi, when they use it across the curriculum, and when they involve parents, uh, then it becomes a very, very powerful tool. Uh, but initially, for the reasons that I mentioned, not all teachers were willing to put in the what they saw as an extra effort to learn a new new tool, new system. They were already under stress. They were trying to deal with uh, the aftermath of or the reality of, of the pandemic and the aftermath of it. So I think what you saw or what you will see if you look at the entire webinar from the teachers is that when you have a team of teachers who are using it together, then uh, they stimulate each other in terms of ideas of how to use it. Uh, they talk m uh, more about how to uh, get students engaged. And so it can be a very, very powerful tool right across the curriculum when you get a team of, of teachers using it within a school. And uh, use being always implementation. <laughs> the yeah. hyper support. I can see one more question, but it just disappeared. No, huh. uh, does Jim have any hands-on tip to teachers if they want to use Binogi to map the knowledge that the students have in different subjects from the education systems in their, in their home countries? Well, I, one of the uh, things that Binogi does, is, is, obviously, as we know, is, is can present content in students' home languages. And so... Uh, if we have a student who comes in, say, age 12, 13, and we want to know, well, where where are they in mathematics or what science have they learned up to this point? Um, there's two two ways in which we can use uh, Binogi here. One is just to let students um, uh, use the tool in terms of um, uh, see where they are in relation to Swedish or Canadian or whatever the, the school standards might be uh, in for a particular grade level. Do they know? this content already, or if we go back to content that's a year earlier, do they know that content? Where are they, where, where is their knowledge based? Where are the gaps that might be there? And one of the things that we've been doing in the Toronto project that uh, Emmanuel Lepichon Enforcement has been leading uh, is mapping the curricula from different countries around the world in terms of what, what content is taught in grade five, grade six, grade seven, grade eight, and how does that compare with the 
Ontario content uh, that students are are learning. So a teacher could look at uh, at what is typically taught in, say, science in in Syria, for example, or in Egypt or other countries, and then see uh, how that compares with the similar content in the Canadian curriculum. So we've got that uh, mapping tool that is is being developed as as we speak. Something we could take part of in some way. <laughs> I, I can. I see uh, one more question here from Kaisa Al. We think it's very hard to start working with students without school background. How do we start? Yeah, th th that's a a really challenging one. Students who who are coming in without having had the opportunity to go to school uh, obviously have major challenges, and uh, we may be mandated by ministers of education to teach particular content at you know grade 8 9 10 11 and obviously that doesn't work when students have no uh, academic background but that doesn't mean that these students are not motivated uh, that they're, they're not intelligent the fact that they've got to a country like Sweden or Canada uh, despite not having uh, opportunities uh, to go to school uh, means that they have a lot of resilience uh, going for them and so we've got to connect with students in terms of their own experience, uh, treat them as the intelligent human beings and resilient human beings that they are, and and work with them from where they are to uh, where they can go within the um, uh, within the school context. And they may have talents that we don't know about. And so that's where having people from that community who can uh, connect with students, uh, figure out where they are, you know what their experiences are, what their talents are, and what their interests are, uh, is a, a first step in terms of seeing uh, how far these students can go. And obviously, some of them may not meet graduation requirements for grade 12 or high school uh, graduation, but they can potentially get those qualifications in adult uh, uh, day schools. So we there's there's no easy solution to those challenges, but the, the fundamental principle is that students are just as intelligent as we'd expect any uh, student to be at that age level. They may have uh, acquired all kinds of skills that are not evident within a classroom. We've got to connect with students where they are and then work with them uh, to, uh, to to develop the potential that they have. But uh, you know, I don't want to under, underestimate the challenges for students or teachers in this situation. Thank you. I agree with you. Most uh, students in that situation have both resilience and grit. <laughs> uh, yeah. So with uh, that, I thank you very much from the bottom of all our hearts uh, for sharing your experience and knowledge, uh, Jim. <music>